All right, so this is uh, Physics 1C. This is the first lecture, and we're going to be talking about electric fields as well as all the topics that are listed here, uh, starting from uh, things that are relatively simple, such as definitions of what a conductor and an insulator is, um, understanding what electric charges are, uh, and then we're going to move into some more complex things. Um, Coulomb's law, which is the, the force between charges, uh, and then electric fields. And I, I think really the goal of today is to talk about electric fields as much as we possibly can. Uh, electric fields produced by different arrangements of charges. Um, just to understand what an electric field is. At the very least, what you want to be able to get out of today's lecture is some personal understanding of what an electric field is and how it's different from forces, because they're different things. Um, because that phrase, electric field, is something we're going to start using just constantly in this class, and you're going to have to have some understanding of what that means. And if your understanding is off by even a little bit, you're going to be confused. I said during our intro that these first three weeks are the hardest. I would say, hands down, like without question, this section of the lecture is the hardest part of the course. And it's day one. So just that's. I hope you guys are ready, because this stuff's going to get hard. We probably won't cover it all today, but at the very least, we're going to get to this, and that's kind of the beginning of what's really difficult about 1C. So, all right, um, try to pay attention. A lot of this stuff is not going to be incredibly interesting, so if you get bored, just try to follow along, because the stuff is really important. Okay, uh, if you guys have any questions, it is being recorded. I started recording right now. It should be up on YouTube moments after the class ends, basically. Okay. Um, all right, so static electricity is what we're going to get started with. Now, I have no way of knowing that this is true, but uh, um, supposedly the kind of first discovery of electricity came from uh, the... <laughs> this is how I know it's not true. I I'm just going to say ancient civilizations, but um, definitely uh, ancient Greeks had... Um, access to something called amber. Do you guys know what amber is? You have to have heard about this before, whether from watching something like Jurassic Park or from maybe, I don't know, maybe your fossilized sap. That's an extremely accurate, yeah, that's kind of basically what it is. So it's sap from trees that's become hardened. And um, yeah, so they figured out this, this amber stuff that when it was rubbed with uh, fabric, or with, with furs, with animal furs and stuff like that, they found that it had the ability to do something that seemed almost magical. They would take this piece of amber, which you can think modern days, like this piece of amber is basically just a piece of plastic. They would rub it with fur. Okay, I'm not going to draw fur on here. And what they found was that... Okay, let me erase this real quick, this little piece. Um, what they found was that um, this amber would basically start to attract little tiny particles. So if this amber was brought near, let's say some pieces of lint or something like that, the lint would, would, would instantly just kind of be attracted to the amber if you got it close enough. And I mean, that's uh, um, kind of magical in a way. So this is something that was supposedly discovered by the ancient Greeks, but you got to believe that like, pretty much any ancient civilization could have figured this out, right? Um, it's been known about for a long time, this property, that this can happen. Um, so the Greek word for amber um, is, uh, is a word that you guys are probably familiar with, something you've probably heard of before, but the Greek word for amber, and it's not spelled exactly like this because you would use Greek letters, but this is the Greek word for amber, is electron. So... So the history of, of electricity kind of starts with that in terms of the words we use, um, because this, this word electron then eventually becomes the word for the object inside of atoms that carries the negative electric charge. So um, nowadays, um, we, can do, we can do experiments where we do exactly this. If you take, uh, and I've got a little picture over here. I'll bring this over here. I'm going to show you guys some videos in a little bit here. Uh, related to some of these static electricity things, but here's a couple examples of some simple things with the static electricity that you can do. Uh, one of them is, instead of rubbing amber, if you rub a balloon, um, 
if you rub a balloon on your shirt or on a piece of fur, um, it, it can do the exact same thing. It can attract small pieces of cloth or something someone may have done that you may have seen before is if you, if you take a balloon and you rub it on your body or on, on your body belt, like on fur in particular or on a uh, cloth and you bring it up next to a wall, it can be attracted to the wall. And why it does that, we can talk more in detail here, but what happens is that uh, atoms inside the wall, um, they basically, the positive charges kind of get pushed away from the positive charges here, or more accurately, the negative charges get pulled. The wall becomes partially kind of polarized so that one side of the wall is negative and then the balloon's attracted to the wall. A similar thing to rubbing of the amber is that you can take a plastic rod. You can do this with a comb at home, by the way. If you take a comb, it has to be a plastic comb, not a metal comb, but if you have a plastic comb, if you rub it with a piece of cloth, a piece of wool, and you take that, that comb, just like this rod right here, and you bring it near some little tiny pieces of paper, you can lift up the pieces of paper, um, very similar to what's happening here with the amber, right? So these are, these are things you can do at home, and I'm gonna show you a video of some other kind of demonstrations of this property. But all these things we call static electricity. Uh, another example of static electricity is your ability to shock people. When you hear the word static electricity, or at least when I do, the first thing I think of is shocking uh, people and things and myself. Uh, for me, one thing that happens on a very regular basis, I have cloth seats in my cars and I'm usually wearing cloth clothing. And um, when I you know, get up out of the seat of my car, the, the kind of rubbing of the cloth fabric on my legs can have a transfer of electrical charge that occurs, and then if I touch my car door, I'll shock myself. Um, you can do the same thing if you have uh, you know, carpet in your house. You can scuff your feet on the carpet. You can develop an electrical charge, and then if you touch something like a piece of metal, uh, it'll, it'll shock you. Okay. Now, the way that all of this is occurring is through this thing that we call electrical charges. In particular, electrons within substances moving from one object to another. So as an example of exactly how this is happening, um, let's draw a rod. So if you take a rod, like this, the, the one that's in this picture here, a plastic rod, let's say for example, so we have a piece of plastic. Plastic is what we're gonna call an insulator. Um, and you take this and then you take some kind of like fur. So you take like some kind of piece of, some kind of cloth that has like, you know, threaded fibers in it or something like that. And you rub this cloth onto the plastic. What ends up happening is that within the plastic there are, there are electrons. So you've got these little tiny electrons that are negative, right? We'll put a little E with a minus sign here. And the action of rubbing it, um, well, it has the effect of taking electrons that are in here and they basically transfer directly into the plastic. You basically, you're literally rubbing electrons, large numbers of electrons because electrons are extremely small. You rub the plastic and uh, the plastic becomes overall negatively charged. Now, in general, things are not charged. Most things are neutral. They carry equal amounts of positive and negative charges because atoms themselves often carry exactly equal numbers of uh, positive and negative charges. So the effect of this then is that our, our, our piece of um, cloth that we rub with here, this thing becomes positively charged. So any type of, of, of rubbing, we call this charging by conduction, by rubbing, um, it has the effect of making one object negative, one object positive. And by doing that, you can, you can start to explore some of the properties of negatively charged objects. Does that make sense to you guys? Most things are neutral by rubbing one thing onto another, certain things become negative, certain things become positive. As an example of another type of object, why are they called static? Well, the process of the electrons getting onto the object is definitely a dynamical process, that's true. But what we're gonna be discussing in today's class is the effect of having something that's already charged, okay? So that the plastic rod gains an electric charge um, static is going to refer to what happens when I put two of these charges together, okay? Does that make sense? Pope Salma? Okay. Yeah, the motion itself is certainly a, uh, but, but the goal is to just, to, is to, is to construct an object that has a charge. 
And then once they kind of move on to here, they, they kind of technically are at rest, but nothing's truly at rest. Anyway, um, so, uh, yeah. What else to say? Oh, the other, I guess, uh, piece of this is if you take a piece of, uh, if you take a piece of glass, this one's a little harder to replicate, but if you have a piece of glass and you rub the glass, let's use pink for this, with, uh, like, silk, so if you have, like, a silk cloth, You do the same thing you rub the glass with the silk cloth you kind of rub it all over then um the effect that this will have is that the glass so again you're going to rub this on this um, the effect that this is going to have is that the glass is going to become positively charged by losing electrons so this is going to be the case the electrons are going to flow over to this guy now How do I know it's electrons and not protons that have to do this with our modern understanding? The silk cloth then becomes negative, by the way. Protons are too massive. Um, that's part of it for sure. Electrons are definitely lighter. These are valence electrons. Yep, they're electrons in the outermost shell that can be that can be easily stripped away due to some things we'll talk about later. The protons are kept in the nucleus by the strong force. That's exactly right. So the protons, in order to move a proton, you need a lot of energy because you need to break them out of the... Uh, the, um, well, uh, out of the nucleus, and, and they're, they're held there, uh, attracted to other protons and attracted to other neutrons due to the strong force. Okay. Is this a good time to just show you some of these uh, these demos? I think it is, because the, the next thing we'll go into is, well, I, I guess I could talk about conductors and insulators just really quickly, and then I'll show you guys some demos. The electrons are easier to move, yeah. Now, you may be, one thing people often wonder is, like, how do you know that the plastic becomes negative and that the wool becomes positive. Well, you'll see some demos where you, you can be convinced of this here in a little bit, but um, there's there's actually a table. Um, they call this the, the triboelectric series. Triboelectric series here. So, uh, here we go. Here's a cat that's covered in stuff by peanuts that are clinging because of static electricity. I've never seen that picture before. That's new. That's good. Um, here we go. So this is the list over here on the right. I don't know how well you guys can see this. I'll just kind of zoom in a little bit so you can see the ones around now. So the way this list works is most positively charged here. So hair is really high up here and oily skin. And then most negatively charged down here. So the way it works is if I take something on the negative side over here, like let's say a PVC pipe, that's something maybe you might have lying around the house if you've got a garage or something like that. PVC pipe or just plastic plastics up here, rubbers up here. If I take one of these and I rub it with anything above it, like for example, cat's fur, this is what we always use in the, um, the demos at school, then the cat's fur becomes positive because it's on the positive side and the PVC becomes negative because it's on the negative side. So you can kind of choose any, anything you've got around the house that has these things. So like polyester, that's a fabric that you might have in some of your shirts. Polyester uh, that would be rubbed with, let's say, rabbits for or like leather or something like that the leather's going to become positive and your shirt's going to become negative hair is hold on a second i can't read what you're saying because my obs is covering it what does it say uh so hair hair is lacking more electrons than a general object it's not so much about lacking because yeah it's more about what mr meower said it tends to give up its electrons it tends to give up its electrons yeah that's right um okay so so that's just something that uh you know, I never learned about this in college. I learned about it because some student asked me about it when I, the first year I taught electricity. They're like, how do you know? So, okay, there's actually an answer. So, um, do we want to talk about, I feel like we want to talk about this before we go into uh, the videos I want to show you. So what's the difference between a conductor and insulator? That's the biggest thing I kind of want to just emphasize here. So, so what's a conductor? What do you guys think? What's a conductor? Anyone read? It conducts electric current. That's right. That's one thing it can do. Usually metals, yeah. So examples of conductors uh, would be, you know, metals. Usually metals. Most conductors that we use in the laboratory are metals. They also can conduct heat. Do you know why that they can? Ah, the electrons move easily. That's the that's the best uh, definition that I that I would say is the electrons are basically free to move. Not all of them, but some. Maybe you could use the language of valence if you want to. Uh, let's 
So the, the language that I learned a long time ago is that a conductor is like a sea of electrons. You can imagine it's like a, a sea that can basically flow left and right. Uh, and um, electrons move easily. Metals love electrons. I don't know if metals love electrons is, is the accurate way to put it. They don't love electrons. They just let electrons move freely. Is the conductivity directly related to the percentage of electrons allowed to move freely? That's the question. That is a very good question. That's true. That's 100% true. So certain atoms will give like one electron per atom. Other electrons might give two electrons per atom. So the, the atoms that give twice as many electrons per atom, you'd think that they'd be much more conductive than they are. So um, the electrons are basically free to move. And that's the key to all electricity. Um, in terms of like electrical circuits is is that you need to have an object that can allow electrons to flow because that's how you get electric current which is what Ash was, was mentioning okay so um, conductor some of the electrons are kind of free to move uh, examples are metals okay someone also mentioned that these things that conduct electricity well also conduct heat well and there's actually a reason for that. Do you guys know why it might be? Yeah, that's basically it, yeah. The, the electrons can conduct the heat too. Um, Heat is related to the vibration of molecules, but it's also related to the vibration of electrons. And the electrons can basically quickly transfer the heat to the uh, to the end of like a long tube that's heated up or something like that. Um, okay, so conductors, electrons are free to move. Okay, what's the other thing? There's two other types of materials that, that we'll kind of discuss in this class. There's three actually, I guess. Um, one would be now insulators. And an insulator is basically just the opposite. In an insulator, the electrons tend to be kind of like stuck in, in, in like near their atoms and stuff like that. It doesn't mean they can't move because silk is an insulator and glass is an insulator. The glass can still give up electrons. Uh, fur is an insulator, plastic is an insulator. The fur can still give up electrons. But insulators, you know, they tend to stop or slow the flow of electrons. So electrons are not so free to move. And what happens when you actually try to move the electrons through an insulator is that it can either burn or spark, okay? So like when you, if you have, I'm sure every single one of you in your life at some point in time has shocked yourself or someone, right? When that occurs, a little, almost like a lightning bolt goes between your finger and whatever you're touching, right? That is literally the air being burnt and ionized by the passage of electrons through a substance, air, which is an insulator. Um, so yeah, they have a really large amount of resistance to electrical flow, and that's actually something we can quantify later on, that we'll, we'll use the, the term resistance, which is an electrical quantity that we can measure. Conductors have very low resistance. Insulators have extremely high resistance, and it's orders of magnitude different, okay? So this is... Um, these are two things that work hand in hand because one of the things we'll be talking um, about in this class is about how to control the flow of electricity, right? And how are we gonna do that? Well, you, you kinda need a combination of both of these things. You need to have a wire that's a conductor, okay? Like copper, so let's say you have a copper wire. But then you don't want the copper wire to just be exposed to the elements, that'll cause some problems. So you actually need it cladded by an insulator. So you're gonna have to have an insulator around this, right? how well I can draw two lines on top of each other. So a copper wire is going to have this insulated cladding on it, right? It's going to be surrounded by an insulator. And that allows you to, like, you know, lay wires on top of each other without electrons flowing from one to the other, if you want to control where they go. And the ability to control where electrons go governs the ability to turn on lights in your home, but it also governs electrical circuitry um, in terms of understanding how a pixel is going to turn on and off it's going to be related to electrical flows and certain voltages that are reached and stuff like that. When you press down a key on your keyboard, there's 
something called a capacitor that's going to change these voltage values as they're read out through these electrical wires that are running through your computer, maybe soldered onto a board or something like that. But uh, the ability to control that flow and the ease with which we can do so is where the power of electricity comes from, is that, is that we know exactly the properties of materials that will let tr certain charges flow, like uh, conductors, and we know things that will not let charges flow, like insulators. There are two other types of materials. Do you guys have any questions so far? I think we go ahead and watch this video now, probably. But Do you guys have any questions? I have to say, this is the point, like, if we were if we were actually in class a couple years ago, I ordered a whole bunch of equipment kits that have um, a lot of this stuff in them, so you could actually do this yourself. Oh my god, what did I do? Um, and you guys could have played with this and explored it, but I think instead we're gonna have to settle with settle with a video. Um, so this is a video I found. I found a lot of different videos on static electricity. This just seemed to be the one that was, I don't know, just kind of in general the it kind of covered enough types of things. And the biggest part about this is, you know, since we're all stuck at home and I can't um, do demos in front of you and let you touch things, you can actually do a lot of these demos at home too. So tell me if the uh, the audio works on this. I don't think it's going to work. It's not important. There's no real audio. It's just kind of music. But Whoa, that's loud. Do you guys hear the audio at all? Not missing much it's just music if you want to watch it on your own screen you can do it right there though so there's the pipe right he's rubbing the pipe so it comes charged this one's really easy to do you can totally do this just have a can Any type of any type of plastic works with this. PVC just happens to be really good at it. It is like magic, right? Yeah, these, I mean. Okay, this one's way more complex. That's pretty cool. So that's just foil. He's weighting it down. So here he's rubbing it, right? So like the rubbing is where you get the charges.
this one's particularly interesting. Uh, so you know water's a neutral molecule, right? Um, but are you serious? I do that again. Um, but you can basically induce charge separation, make one side of the water negative. If this, wait, 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 I guess you make one side of the water positive, so it's attracted to this, basically. This is uh, this one's really easy to do. He did it with a cup. You could do it with a stream of water from your sink, actually, too. That's that's what we do when we do it at school. So they're all rubbed with the fur there. So they're all the same charge. That's like opposites, uh, you know, uh, like like charges um, repel each other. Electroscope is a device used for um, measuring charges. We have a lot of these in the lab. This is like a homemade version of it. We'll talk about hoverboards. See, this one's really like magic, right? Why can't you make this kind of stuff for hoverboards? Um, no, it's a plastic bag. That was a plastic bag in the hours. In the last part. Again, this like all these things are really easy to do at home. Um, I guess we're not going to watch this one because that one had the same thing. Um, so we're actually going to talk about hoverboards at some point in this class, uh, Faison. Um, how much electric force would you need to carry an adult-sized human? I think the answer is a force equal to their weight, right? So it's less a question of, like, how much force you would need as how much charge you'd have to have. Um, but uh, with, with static electricity, um, it, there's a problem that these, these type of objects, when we charge them, they tend to not hold their charge forever. Does that make sense? Um, so you can rub and make this plastic positive, which is, or sorry, negative, which is most of those things in that video we just saw was just, you know, someone rubbing something to make it, a piece of plastic to make it negative, right? But then once it's negative, right, um, all those excess negative charges, um, they, they can be kind of carried off by humidity in the air. Like the, the water vapor in the air is going to naturally cause these electric charges to kind of just be, to escape the object they don't permanently stay there um it takes time but eventually the plastic just loses all of its charge um so you'd have to find a way to make sure that you contain the charge and make sure that it's not lost and um there, there are ways to do that but doing it in an open system like a hoverboard i think would probably be kind of difficult but that's not to say that you shouldn't try to think about how to make it work um another thing i'll say about hoverboards is that um there's conductors, there's insulators, there's something called semiconductors, which show up in uh, a lot of computer parts, uh, silicon and um, germanium and carbon. But there's another type of uh, substance called superconductors that we're going to talk about much later in the class. And while it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class how they work, they do have the ability to construct something that would work like a hoverboard. And we'll watch, we're going to watch some uh, videos from like a TED talk where he showed, you know, he kind of like demonstrates the proof of principle for how a hoverboard would work. Um, and uh, yeah, so hoverboards are possible, just maybe not with static electricity because static electricity um, isn't <clears throat> isn't as permanent as, um, well, neither is, anyway, we'll see. Okay, do you guys have any questions? 
it's just kind of a general introduction to what we mean by electricity. Um, we're going to go into specifics by talking about electric charges and then Coulomb's law to see understand forces, but, but these are the basics. And um, a lot of what you saw in that last video can be summarized by something that you probably learned a long time ago, which is that if I take a, a positive charge and I take another positive charge and I get them close to each other, they repel each other, right? There's a force that causes them to repel. But if I take a positive charge and I get it close to a negative charge, these two are attracted, right? So like charges repel and unlike charges um, are attracted to each other. Right, like this, and these attract, right? That's why this thing works here. It's partly why these things are attracted um, is because of the same similar kind of thing that happens here. So those are the basics of, of electrical kind of interactions of static electricity. Does anyone have any, any questions? Did you want to ask some questions about the video itself? Did anyone have any, want to go back to any of the pieces of it and talk about like, why did something happen? I can pull it back up. Suspending the plastic bag. The electric field is short range. No, that's not true. It has infinite range. It has infinite range. Okay, so the bag here. So notice that bo both objects get rubbed. So the cloth gets rubbed on that. The plastic bag gets rubbed on the shirt. So now they're both negative. Okay. The plastic is negative. The um, the rod is negative, and so they repel each other. And because the plastic bag can also catch air currents and float naturally with the air currents. When you combine those two things, it can make it feel as though it's hovering. So that's that's effectively how that one works. And again, you, you can totally try this yourself at home. I don't, I don't know how much PVC, PVC pipe costs, but it does not cost much if you go to like a, a tool store or something. The electric field has an infinite range, that's right. And that's something we will, we will look at here in a second. The distance between them makes it so the force between them is increased. It does get weaker the farther apart they are, but these two objects are close enough together, you know? And you have to understand that I think she's just delivering, if you watch carefully what happens, she's just delivering like little impulses. I'll just turn this down, it's really loud. So look, it's like, it's already floating. Let's keep that in mind. Like plastic by itself is kind of gonna float. She just is just giving it like little, little pushes, right? Just a little tiny push to make sure it doesn't completely fall down, right? Cause you can see it starts to fall. She just keeps kind of moving it and balancing. This would be kind of like balancing a, um, a baseball bat on one end, you gotta keep moving your hand beneath it. It's, it's a pretty similar kind of pro uh, process that's going on there. Okay. Um, there, there's a lot more that we could say about this stuff. Um, and in particular, I'm leaving out a process that's called charging by induction, but if you wanna read about that, you can. Um, I would like to kind of start talking specifically about electric charges and what they are about. So what I was describing before was merely kind of like the macroscopic phenomena that we observe um, when you rub things together, static shocks, all these kinds of things. But well, what's causing all of these things, we have this modern knowledge of um, what objects are made of. Objects are made of atoms, right? And atoms uh, are composed of a nucleus and then electrons that are whirling around that nucleus. Usually by the time you get in this class, you've either learned that from you know, kindergarten, high school, wherever, or you learned it in chemistry. But, but electric charges are produced by these atoms and the parts that they have. So there, there are three kind of things inside of an atom, right? You've got, you've got the nucleus that contains your protons, and protons have a positive charge. You have neutrons that contain, oops, or have a, a neutral charge. They have a charge that's zero. And then you've got electrons, and electrons have uh, a negative charge. Now, what's interesting about the charges themselves is that the charge on an electron is a very specific number. And um, a guy named uh, Millikan, 
uh, who's a scientist we're going to talk about uh, a bit later on too, he, he figured out that all charges, okay, an electric charge, the symbol that we used for it is uh, a little Q. This is our symbol for electric charge. Um, he found out that electrons carry a charge, okay? Their charge is negative E, okay? And little e represents the charge on a single electron, okay? Protons, they're positive, but what's very surprising, maybe it's not very surprising, is that they have exactly the opposite charge of the electron, positive E and negative E. They're exactly the same. They, they almost have to be exactly the same. If they were even just a little bit different, then every single atom would either be positive or negative, right? If, if the proton had, let's say, a tenth of a percent more charge than the electron, there's so many protons inside of us that we would all be positive, right? And the Earth would be positive, and the Sun would be positive. It would be just massive possible force between the two of them, okay? They have exactly the same charge. And it turns out that all charges come in increments of plus or minus uh, uh, a number, i.e. an integer, um, or a, uh, sorry, a, a whole number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, of the electric charge. It comes in multiples. So we say that, that charge is something that's quantized. It always comes in discrete packets, right? You always get one electron or two electron or more realistically, trillions of electrons of charge, okay? But it always comes in integer multiples of the electric charge itself. You can have positive, you can have negative. The charge on any object will always be able to be reduced down to some number of electrons. And that was figured out by, uh, by Millikan. So, Protons are positive, electrons are negative. Why isn't it infinitely reducible? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, up till now in physics, um, I guess depending on what you've taken before, whether it be 1b or 1a or whatever, um, protons do have quarks. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, the, uh, the quantities that we've discussed up till now, things like energy and length, length is the best one as an example. Length is a continuous type of thing um there's no fundamental limit on like a length there's no unit of length that everything can be thought of in terms of of course we can construct arbitrary units right a centimeter but then we can divide the centimeter into millimeters and we can divide the millimeters into micrometers and we can divide the micrometers into nanometers and we keep doing that forever um the size of the nucleus is 10 to the negative 15 meters and then you can go inside the proton and you get smaller sizes as well. So it's a, it's a continuum of values that you have with, um, with length. Um, the same thing is true of velocity, time, um, and thereby force, acceleration, and all the other quantities that you learn about in 1A. So what about 1B? Well, temperature seems, at least from the things that you learn in 1B, to be something that has a scale that you can take on. Energy is the same way. But what's interesting is that um, some of those things aren't true. And energy itself can actually be quantized as well. But you don't learn the details of that until you get to 1D. Um, and that was something that was figured out by a guy named Max Planck. Max Planck. But charge is something that uh, maybe this was the first thing we realized could be quantized. I think it was. I think electric charge was the first quant like quantizable, like quantized um, value that we that we had. Now there's other things that are quantized. Quantized is a word that can sound. It just means there's the, there's a, there's a limit. There's a smallest part. Um, if I get a if I get a, uh, a a bucket and I fill it with twelve oranges, right? You say there's twelve oranges in there. The number of oranges is quantized too, in a way, right? I mean, sure you can cut an orange in half, but then it's a half of an orange, right? And uh, if I had a bucket of twelve oranges and I cut one in half, I'd have eleven oranges, and I'd have two halves of an orange, right? So, so oranges can be quantized. Bananas can be quantized. Does that make sense? It's because it's not. It's the. It's the. It's the full thing that you're calling the banana, not the peel or the parts inside of it. It's the whole thing is the banana, right? So, so quantized just means that we're saying there's a stopping point, right? What is something that isn't quantized? Length. Length is something that's not quantized. Time is not quantized. Yeah. Length and time, and then uh, thereby volume and you know. Mass, 
Mass is not quantized either. I mean, yeah. Everything's made up of atoms, but the atoms themselves, while they have fixed masses... Um, yeah, I don't think mass is quantized. Not in a realistic way. Alright, so, so what about... Um, someone mentioned quarks. So quarks actually are the one thing in the universe that violate this one rule right here. They don't completely violate it, though. So within the proton, okay, a proton can be broken down. Does that look like an R? Not really. A proton can be bro broken down into... It's, it's, it's not really... It's not really a whole object. You can you can split the proton into pieces. And what it's made up of is uh, basically three things. It's made up of an up quark, um, another up quark. Oh my god, I'm just not... I don't know what I'm doing right now. Okay. Up quark, up quark, and a... Uh, see? I'm getting ahead of myself as I'm talking. Up, up, down. All of these are what we call quarks. Okay? But the quarks themselves are charged. Okay, the up quark carries a charge that is equal to uh, positive two thirds of the electron charge, and the down quark is composed of a charge that's uh, or has a charge that's negative one third the electron charge. So this rule is kind of violated with quarks, except it's also not really violated, and I'll explain why. While we can break the quark the proton into parts of the up up and down quarks that it's made up of. The quarks themselves do not survive alone. So try as you might, you're never going to find an up quark by itself in nature. You're never going to find a down quark by itself in nature. We can produce them for brief, like, instants of time, but they, they immediately turn into other objects, okay? Um, so, so these things never exist alone. But it turns out, and you can do the math yourself, if I take the, the charge on an up quark, and I add to it the charge on another up quark, and I add to it the charge on a down quark, what do you get? Can you guys do that math yourselves? If I know that one of the up quarks has a charge of positive two-thirds, the other one's positive two-thirds, you get one, right? So if you sum up their charges, well, you still get plus one E, right? And because you never find the up or down quark alone in nature, they always come in either pairs, triplets, or quintuplets, um, you'll always get some integer multiple of the electron charge okay for the neutron if you want to see what the neutron's made of it's also made of um um it's also made of quarks and this one is made of a down and up and a down we often just use du and d for these so dud is how i remember this personally because it's a dud it doesn't have a charge um and if you add up those charges you'll get that the total charge there is going to be zero times the electron charge do electrons have quarks no Electrons, as far as we know, are a fundamental, they're a fundamental um, particle. We have never been able to break apart an electron. It doesn't mean that we can't break electrons apart, but we've never been able to do so. Um, in addition, in order for a particle to be broken down, it has to have something that it can kind of break down into, and we don't know of anything that's, that's really possible for the electron to break down into. It's not possible. They don't have quarks. They are they are what we call a fundamental particle, as far as we know. Yep. Okay, so like the biggest thing I want to take out of this is to know that electric charge is quantized. You're always going to have some multiple of the electron charge. Uh, how do electrons have the opposite charge of a proton with less mass? Well, uh, the the charge itself is is kind of independent of the mass of the particle. The mass is uh, is one thing, and the charge is another thing. Um. The, the amount of charge that the object can carry is not, the mass doesn't matter, basically, if that makes any sense. It is a fundamental property of the particle itself that it, ca that it carries a charge. Um, it, does, that, does that make any sense? It's, it's, it's just, it's a, what you'll learn in 1D is it, we call it a quantum number. It's just kind of one of the properties that we observe of these fundamental particles. It's, something we observe and therefore we can measure i can't go much beyond that like i can't answer the question of um what you know fundamentally like why do they have charge or um how can something so small and something so large because I, I, what you're getting at here is that 
So let's say that I, I say the mass of the electron is m sub e. The, the mass of the proton, it turns out, is on the order of 2,000 times as big as the mass of the electron. Okay? So that, that's where you're getting at, right? This is so much bigger. And yet, it's a good question. How, could, how do they carry exactly the same charge? And you got to kind of disentangle mass and, and, and charge from each other is the only thing I can say. But it's definitely a good question. So this is fundamentally where all charges come from. Every single, every single one of them. And, and something else to mention about charged particles is that only charged particles can produce the phenomenon that we call light. So you can't see things that don't have charges. You know, at least are made up of charges. It's one of the, one of the things that, that we know now is that, that charges are actually the thing that produce light. So without charges, you, you wouldn't have light. Oh, charge conservation. Not only is charge quantized, but 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 electric charge is cons it's a conserved quantity. You can't like create or destroy it. Um, just like energy, um, it can just be transferred between objects. If that makes sense. Uh, so electric charge is conserved. It's a conserved quantity. This is kind of the idea up here of if I take a, a neutral piece of fur and I take a neutral piece of plastic and I rub one on the other, the total charge doesn't, you don't just gain charge out of nowhere, you're just transferring the charge. And the total charge of both of them would still be zero even after that, that uh, transfer has occurred. So electric charge is a conserved quantity. This is gonna be one of the rules we'll use to derive some things in this class. In all interactions that we know about, electric charge is conserved. It's one of the most fundamental conservation laws that we have in the universe. Just like energy, just like momentum, um, you, you cannot get rid of charges. You can't just magically make it go away, as far as we know. This is, this is a pretty well-tested theory, too. All right, so um, next is Coulomb's law. All right, so I introduced the idea that, that charges can repel if they're the same. Um, they can attract if they're different. And um, it's important to be able to understand how much do they attract. Like, does it depend on how big the charge is? It does. Does it depend on how far away they are? It does. Those are the two things. Those are the main things. And Coulomb's Law is our, our explanation of how that works. So... All right, so how do we determine how strong the force is? So a guy named Charles Coulomb came up with this experiment. It's an experiment that may look familiar to you because it's an experiment that uh, Cavendish used to, to describe the, um, the force between two massive objects, the gravitational force. I'm gonna make this just a little bit smaller so we can put it on the screen. So here's an example of what Coulomb did. It's a torsion balance. It was used to establish his law, okay? And I'll write down what his law states. His law states the following. If I have a, uh, a positively charged object here, for example, now let's say we don't know if it's positive or negative, actually. Let's say we just have a charge, okay? I have a charge right here, and I call it Q sub 1, and I'm going to use a circle. This is usually what we do to represent charges, or a dot. And let's say over here I have another charge, and I call it Q2, and that they're separated by, um, by some distance. Um, and let's say that the distance they're separated by, we give that a name. So this is the distance between their centers. We call that distance R. And we have a charge with Q, another charge with Q. Then there's going to be a force between the two objects. And let's just say for simplicity's sake that these two objects both carry a positive charge. In that case, this one would be a force that would point this way. And we probably call it the force of object two on object one. It would be a vector. And you'd have an equal and opposite force pointing the opposite direction. Um, and you could call that one, let's say, the force of one on two. And the value of this force, they're, they're equivalent to each other. So F21 magnitude would be equal to F12 magnitude. And that force is basically proportional to uh, three things. 
um, the size of the charge on one object. You multiply that by the size of the charge on the other object. So the bigger the charges are, the bigger the force is going to be. That certainly should, I hope, make sense. The larger the charge is, the bigger the force. And then you have to divide by the distance. Um, but it's not just the distance. You have to divide by the distance squared. Okay? And that's basically the form of Coulomb's law that he would have written down. And he would, he would have used the form of units in which this turned into force after you did this calculation. Okay? Nowadays, in order to make this work out, um, we have to include a constant. And that constant in this class is either going to be labeled as k. You'll also see it labeled as k with a little e underneath it. I'm almost always just going to use k. Um, and that's that's a constant to make it so that our, our units for charge uh, give us units of force. But this is what we call Coulomb's law. And I'm probably not pronouncing it right. His name is Charles Coulomb. He was a uh, he was French, so I'm really bad at French pronunciation. It's uh, Coulomb's law. I should have capitalized that because it is a person's name. All right. And I'm going to give you the, the modern units we use for these things, but I think it's more important that you understand generally what the form is before we even do that. Why? The question is, why are the magnitudes of the forces equal even if each charge has different positive charges? Does anyone know the answer to that question? Uh, it's not because they have to cancel. Newton's Law, there's three of them. Which one is it, George? This is an inverse square law. It's similar to Newton's Law of Gravitation, but yeah, Newton's third law is the answer to your question, Ash. Um, they're equal because for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. This is very similar to the gravitational law, and we're gonna we're gonna reintroduce that in a problem that we're gonna do here in a second. But let's let's talk about the um, let's talk about like what these things are. So so Q, the charge, this is generally measured in terms of our SI system, uh, in named after this guy, Coulombs. No, not his. But it's measured in Coulombs. Now I told you that all electrical charges are related to the electron charge. So our definition of what the Coulomb is is going to be related to the electron charge. So if E, the symbol E, get to know, get to get comfortable with the idea that when I write this, I, I specifically mean the charge on an electron, the absolute value of it, not negative or positive. Um, a single electron has an extremely tiny amount of, uh, of Coulombs of charge. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, a number that's so small it's very hard to understand and imagine. But that's our fundamental unit of charge. All units of charge can be reduced down to this, and it's actually 1.609 or something like that. But to two digits, it's 1.6, and this is usually good enough for most of the problems that we're going to do. 1.6, that's a Coulomb. That's, 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 that's how we think of, of what a Coulomb is. Um, most of the problems you guys are going to do, things are going to be measured in micro Coulombs. Um, I can give you a little bit of an idea of like, uh, I guess an everyday, it's not so everyday here in California, but certainly you guys have all seen lightning strikes, right? Um, when there's lightning that strikes the ground, there's generally a transfer, and now it depends on if the cloud's positive or negative, but regardless, there's generally kind of a transfer of about 20 coulombs, something on that order, it might be 10, it might be 5, but there's generally a transfer of 20 coulombs of charge. Now, which direction it goes is going to depend on which of these bodies is positive and which is negative, but it's really not important as as the bigger thing to understand is just that the quantity that's being transferred is something like 20 coulombs. That's a lot. That's a lot. I think it usually goes the other way. I think the, the Earth is usually negative and the clouds are usually positive. If that was the case, I'd flip this, and maybe I should, actually. Um, this is something I do not know a lot about. I haven't studied a lot of meteorology, but um, I believe a lot of the time what happens is that the charge on the cloud becomes positive, um, and the, the ground is generally negative, and that causes the, the flow of charges to basically go in this direction. But 20 coulombs, it's, it's, it's tons and tons of electrons. It's a huge amount of charge. Um, okay. <clears throat> so most of the things we'll be talking about in this class will be micro coulombs, nano coulombs. Okay, what else? Um, we've also got this symbol K right here, right? And K 
is approximately equal to, you can get a, a more detailed version of this. I just This is the easiest one to use for me. It's easy to remember. It's 9 times 10 to the 9, and then you need units, right? And you can investigate the units of what this needs to be, right? You want it. You want to get newtons on the left side. You need to cancel out with the, the r squared in the denominator. That requires a meter squared up here to cancel out, right? If this has meters squared in it, it'll cancel with the distance here. And then you also got to divide by coulomb squared, okay? That's your that's the k, the electric constant. It sits in front of this equation and it adds power to the equation in a way because it's nine billion, right? So after doing this calculation, you multiply by nine billion. So that gives you a pretty big increase in whatever these values might give you for the total force. And this is in a way kind of evidence of how strong the electric force is. Okay. Um, there's another symbol that you're going to see show up a lot in this class. And it's really important for you to understand that it's quite simply just a rearrangement of this symbol. So another way to write k is to write it like this. 1 divided by 4 pi times a symbol called epsilon naught. Epsilon naught has a kind of a neat name. It's the permittivity of free space. Um, we'll learn about why that name exists later on. But um, the value of epsilon naught is this value here. And the units for this are flipped. So this one's coulomb squared divided by newton meter squared. It's important that you understand this one and this one. Okay. So let's let's ask some questions to kind of test your understanding of what this law right here says. So uh, let me just let me just grab a piece of it and we'll move it down a little bit here. So let's so th this is your general this is your general equation. And so let's let's say that I have two objects, right? So let's say that I've got a um, an object that has a charge that we call positive Q, and another object that we have over here that we have a charge that's called positive Q, and we separate them by a distance that we call R, okay? And we say that that produces just some unit of force. We say that this produces a force that we call one times F. Both both objects feel that force one times F. Suppose that I take the same two objects, right? and I move them closer to each other. So I take the same charge, positive Q here and positive Q, but I put them a distance away from each other that's half the distance, okay? What happens to the force between them in this case? That was really fast. Four times, that's right. And you figure that out, hopefully by seeing that it's in the denominator, half the distance, and you get four times as much, right? So the force in this case would become, and I'm not gonna draw it to scale, but this would be four times the force here four times the force on this one. I can kind of draw it on this side, I suppose. Um, not, not, now, now no, understanding the game of what I'm asking here, I'm going to ask you the same thing. So take, again, start from here. This is our starting point, right? Um, what happens if I cut both charges in half? Okay, so if I do Q over 2 and Q over 2, right, but I keep them the same distance R away, what's going to happen to the force now? Oh, it looks like a 9. Sorry, it's a Q. I'm kind of rushing because it's already 7. I want to give you guys a break. This is one fourth, right? Okay. So, so that's good. Good way to understand what's going on in this. Uh, it's by, by kind of analyzing these things in this way. Okay. Um, do you guys have any general questions before we take a break? We've been going for an hour, so it's definitely time to take a break. So we'll do a ten-minute break, and I'll stop the recording.